Section One of Fairy Prince and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Fairy Prince and Other Stories by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. Section One Fairy Prince. Part One. In my father's house were many fancies. Always, for instance, on every Thanksgiving day, it was the custom in our family to bud the Christmas tree. Young Derry Willard came from Cuba. His father and our father had been chums together at college. None of us had ever seen him before. We were very much excited to have a strange young man invited for Thanksgiving dinner. My sister Rosalie was seventeen. My brother Carol was eleven. I myself was only nine, but with very tall legs. Young Derry Willard was certainly excited when he saw the Christmas tree. Excited enough, I mean, to shift his eyes for at least three minutes from my sister Rosalie's face. Lovely as my sister Rosalie was, it had never yet occurred to any of us, I think, until just that moment, that she was old enough to have perfectly strange young men stare at her so hard. It made my father rather nervous. He cut his hand on the carving knife. Nothing ever made my mother nervous. Except for father cutting his hand, it seemed to be a very nourishing dinner. The tomato soup was pink with cream. The roast turkey didn't look a single bit sad like any one you'd seen before. There was plenty of hard-boiled egg with the spinach. The baked potatoes were frosted with red pepper. There was mince pie, there was apple pie, there was pumpkin pie. There were nuts and raisins. There were gay gold paper bonbons, and everywhere all through the house the funny blunt smell of black coffee. It was my brother Carol's duty always to bring in the Christmas tree. By some strange mix-up of what is and what isn't, my brother Carol was dumb, stark dumb, I mean, and from birth but though he had never found his voice, he had at least never lost his shining face. Even now, at eleven, in the twilighty end of a rainy Sunday, or most any day, when he had an earache, he still let mother call him shining face. But if any children called him shining face, he kicked them. Even when he kicked people, though, he couldn't stop his face shining. It was very cheerful. Everything about Carol was very cheerful. No matter, indeed, how much we might play and whisper about gifts and tinsels and jolly-colored candles, Christmas never, I think, seemed really probable to any of us until that one jumpy moment, just at the end of the Thanksgiving dinner, when, heralded by a slam in the woodshed, a hoppity skip in the hall, the dining-room door flung widely open on Carol's eyes, twinkling like a whole sky full of stars through the shaggy dark branches of a young spruce tree. It made young Derry Willard laugh right out loud. Why, of all funny things, he said, on Christmas Day, why, it looks like a Christmas tree. It is a Christmas tree, explained my sister Rosalie very patiently. My sister Rosalie was almost always very patient, but I had never seen her patient with a young man before. It made her cheeks very pink. It is a Christmas tree, she explained. That is, it's going to be a Christmas tree. Just the very first second we get it budded, it'll start right in to be a Christmas tree. Budded? puzzled young Derry Willard. Really, for a person who looks so much like the picture of the fairy prince in my best story book, he seemed just a little bit slow. Why, of course, it's got to be budded, I cried. That's what it's for. That's... Instead of just being pink patient, my sister Rosalie started in suddenly to be dimply patient, too. It's from Mother's Christmas tree garden, you know, she went right on explaining. Mother's got a winter garden, a Christmas tree garden. Father's got a garden, too, I maintained stoutly. Father's is a spring garden. Reds, blues, yellows, greens, whites. From France and Holland and California and Asia Minor. Tulips, you know. Busters! Oh, Father's garden is a glory, I boasted. And Mother's garden, said my mother very softly, is only a story. It's an awfully nice story, said Rosalie. 
Young Derry Willard seemed to like stories. Tell it, he begged. It was Rosalie who told it. Why, it was when Carol was born, she said. It was on a Christmas Eve, you know. That's why Mother named him Carol. We didn't know then, you see, interrupted my mother very softly, that Carol had been given the gift of silence rather than the gift of speech. And Father was so happy to have a boy, dimpled Rosalie, that he said to Mother, Well, now, I guess you've got everything in the world that you want. And Mother said, Everything, except a spruce forest. So Father bought her a spruce forest, said Rosalie. That's the story. Oh, my dear, laughed my Mother, that isn't a story at all. All you've told is the facts. It's the feeling of the facts that makes a story, you know. It was on my birthday, glowed Mother, that the presentation was to be made. My birthday was in March. I was very much excited and came down to breakfast with my hat and coat on. Where are you going? said my husband. Oh, Mother, protested Rosalie. Whither away was what you always told us, he said. Whither away? Of course was what he said, laughed my Mother. Why, I'm going to find my spruce forest, I told him, and I can't wait a moment longer. Is it the big one over beyond the mountain, I implored him, or the little grove that the deacon tried to sell you last year? And they never budged an inch from the house, interrupted Rosalie. It was the funniest. Over in the corner of the room my father laughed out suddenly. My father had left the table. He and Carol were trying very hard to make the spruce tree stand upright, in a huge pot of wet earth. The spruce tree didn't want to stand upright. My father laughed all over again. But it wasn't at the spruce tree. Well, now, wouldn't it have been a pity, he said, to have made a perfectly good lady fare forth on a cold March morning to find her own birthday present? My mother began to clap her hands. It was a very little noise, but jolly. It came by mail, she cried my whole spruce forest in a package no bigger than my head. Then your rather fluffy head, corrected my father. Three hundred spruce seedlings, cried my mother, each one no bigger than a wisp of grass. Like little green ferns they were, so tender, so fluffing, so helpless. Hi ho, said young Derry Willard. Well, I guess you laugh then. When grown-up people are trying to remember things outside themselves, I've noticed they always open their eyes very wide, but when they are remembering things inside themselves, they shut their eyes very tight. My mother shut her eyes very tight. No, I didn't exactly laugh, said my mother, and I didn't exactly cry. You wouldn't eat, cried Rosalie, not all day, I mean. Father had to feed you with a spoon. It was in the wing chair. You held the box on your knees. You just shone and shone and shone. It would have been pretty hard, said my mother, not to have shown a little, to brood a baby forest in one's arms, if only for a single day. Think of the experience. Even at the very thought of it, she began to shine all over again. Funny little fluff of green, she laughed, no fatter than a fern. Her voice went suddenly all wabbly like a preacher's. But oh, the glory of it, she said, the potential majesty, great sweeping branches. Nests for birds, shade for lovers, masts for ships to plough the great world's waters, timbers perhaps for cathedrals. Oh, shivered my mother. It certainly gave one a very queer feeling. No woman surely in the whole wide world, except the mother of the little Christ, ever felt so astonished to think what she had in her lap. Young Derry Willard looked just a little bit nervous. Oh, but of course Mother couldn't begin all at once to raise cathedrals, I hastened to explain. So she started in raising Christmas presents instead. We raise all our own Christmas presents, and just as soon as Rosalie and I are married, we're going to begin right away to raise our children's Christmas presents, too. Heaps for everybody, even if there is a hundred. Carol, of course, won't marry because he can't propose. Ladies don't like written proposals, Father said ladies. Young Derry Willard asked if he might smoke. He smoked cigarettes. He took them from a gold-looking case. They smelled very romantic. Everything about him smelled very romantic. His hair was black, his eyes were black, 
He looked as though he could cut your throat without flinching if you were faithless to him. It was beautiful. I left the table as soon as I could. I went and got my best story book. I was perfectly right. He looked exactly like the picture of the fairy prince on the front page of the book. There were heaps of other pictures, of course, but only one picture of a fairy prince. I looked in the glass. I looked just exactly the way I did before dinner. It made me feel queer. Rosalie didn't look at all the way she looked before dinner. It made me feel very queer. When I got back to the dining room, everybody was looking at the little spruce tree, except young Derry Willard and Rosalie. Young Derry Willard was still looking at Rosalie. Rosalie was looking at the toes of her slippers. The fringe of her eyelashes seemed to be an inch long. Her cheeks were so pink I thought she had a fever. No one else came to bud the Christmas tree, except Carol's tame coon and the tame crow. Carol is very unselfish. He always buds one wish for the coon, and one for the crow. The tame coon looked rather jolly and gold-powdered in the firelight. The crow never looked jolly. I have heard of white crows, but Carol's crow was a very dark black, Wherever you put him, he looked like a sorrow. He sat on the arm of Rosalie's chair and nibbed at her pink sleeve. Young Derry Willard pushed him away. Young Derry Willard and Rosalie tried to whisper. I heard them. How old are you? whispered Rosalie. I'm twenty-two, whispered young Derry Willard. Oh, said Rosalie. How young are you? whispered Derry Willard. I'm seventeen, whispered Rosalie. Oh, said Derry Willard. My mother started in very suddenly to explain about the Christmas tree. There were lots of little pencils on the table, and blocks of paper, and nice cold shining sheets of tinfoil. There was violet colored tinfoil, and red colored tinfoil, and green, and blue, and silver, and gold. Why, it's just a little family custom of ours, Mr. Willard, explained my mother. After the Thanksgiving dinner is over, and we're all, I trust, feeling reasonably plump and contented, and there's nothing special to do except just to dream and think, why, we just list out the various things that we'd like for Christmas, and... Most people end Thanksgiving, of course, explained my father, by trying to feel thankful for the things they've already had. But this seems to be more like a scheme for expressing thanks for the things that we'd like to have. The violet tinfoil is Rosalie's, I explained. The green is mine. The red is mother's. The blue is father's. The silver is Carol's. Mother takes each separate wish just as soon as it's written, and twists it all up in a bud of tinfoil, and takes wire, and wires the bud on the tree. Gold buds, silver buds, red, green, everything, all bursty and shining, like spring. It looks as though rainbows had rained on it. It looks as though sun and moon had warmed it at the same time. And then we all go and get our little iron banks. All the Christmas money, I mean, that we've been saving and saving for a whole year, and dump it all out round the base of the tree. Nickels, dimes, quarters, pennies, everything, and dump them all out round the base of the tree? Puzzled young Derry Willard. Carol did something suddenly that I never saw him do before with a stranger. He wrote the conversation on a sheet of paper and waved it at young Derry Willard. It was a short conversation, but it was written very tall. Fertilizer, explained Carol. My father made a little laugh. In all my experience with horticulture, he said, I know of no fertilizer for a Christmas tree that equals a judicious application of nickels, dimes, and quarters, well stirred in. Our Uncle Charlie was here once for Thanksgiving, I cried. He stirred in a twenty-dollar gold piece. Our Christmas tree bloomed everything that year. It bloomed tinsel pom-poms on every branch, and gold-ribbon bow knots. It bloomed a blackboard for Carol, and an ice-cream freezer for Mother, and— and then we take the tree, explained my mother, and carry it into the parlor and shut the door. And lock the door, said my father. 
and no one ever sees puzzled young derry willard what was written in the wishes no one i said rosalie laughed some one must see said rosalie cause just about a week before christmas father and mother always go up to town and oh of course mother has to see i admitted mother is such friends with christmas and father laughed rosalie is such friends with mother usually i said eh said father and then explained mother on christmas morning we all go to the parlor and there's a fire in the parlor i explained a great hollow yule log all stuffed full of crackly pine cones and sputtering sparklers and funny colored blazes that father buys at a firework shop and the candles are lighted and 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 all the tinfoil buds have bloomed into presents laughed derry willard oh no of course not all of them said mother no tree ever fulfills every bud said my father there's carol's camel of course laughed rosalie ever since carol was big enough to wish he's always wished for a camel but mostly of course i insisted he wishes for kites he got nine kites last christmas kites murmured young derry willard kites i said i have to talk a good deal once always for myself and all over again for carol it seemed a good time to talk for carol perhaps a person who came all the way from cuba could tell us the thing we wanted to know oh carol's very much interested in kites i confided and in relationships in christmas relationships especially when he grows up he's going to be some sort of a jenny something i think it's an ologist or else keep a kite shop yes murmured young derry willard there are two ways i've noticed to make one listen to you one is to shout the other is to whisper i decided to whisper you don't seem to understand i whispered it's christmas relationships that are worrying carol and me so it worries us dreadfully oh of course we understand all about the little baby christ and the camels and the wise men and the frankincense that's easy but who is santa claus unless unless it was carol himself who signaled me to go on unless he's the baby christ's grandfather i thought derry willard looked a little bit startled carol's ears turned bright red of course we meant on his mother's side i hastened to assure him it is i admit a new idea to me said young derry willard but i seem to have gotten several new ideas to-day he looked at mother mother's mouth looked very funny he looked at father father seemed to be sneezing he looked at rosalie they laughed together his whole face suddenly was very laughing and what becomes he asked of all the christmas tree buds that don't bloom it was a funny question it didn't have a thing in the world to do with santa claus being a grandfather oh mother never throws away any of the buds laughed rosalie she just keeps them year after year and wires them on all over again all unfulfilled wishes said my mother still waiting still wishing maybe they'll bloom some time even carol's camel she laughed out suddenly who knows sonny boy but what if you keep on wishing you'll actually travel some day to the land where camels live maybe maybe you'll own a, a dozen camels with purple velvet blankets i cried all trimmed with scarlet silk tassels and smelling of sandalwood i have never understood said my father that camels smelt of sandalwood young derry willard didn't seem exactly nervous any more but he jumped up very suddenly and went and stood by the fire it's the finest christmas idea i ever heard of he said and if nobody has any objections i'd like to take a little turn myself at budding the christmas tree oh but you won't be here for christmas cried everybody all at once no i certainly shan't be admitted derry willard unless i am invited why of course you're invited cried everybody father seemed to have swallowed something so mother invited him twice father kept right on choking everybody was frightened but mother young derry willard had to run like everything to catch his train 
It was lucky that he knew what he wanted. With only one wish to make, and only half a minute to make it in, it was wonderful that he could decide so quickly. He snatched a pencil. He scribbled something on a piece of paper. He crumbled the something all up tight and tossed it to Mother. Carol and Mother wadded it into a tinfoil bud. They took the gold-colored tinfoil. Rosalie and I wired it to a branch. We chose the highest branch we could reach. Father held his overcoat for him. Father handed him his bag. Father opened the door for him. He ran as fast as he could. He waved his hand to everybody. His laugh was all sparkly with white teeth. The room seemed a little bit dark after he had gone. The firelight flickered on the tame coon's collar. Sometimes it flickered on the single gold bud. We cracked more nuts and munched more raisins. It made a pleasant noise. The tame crow climbed up on the window sill and tapped and tapped against the glass. It was not a pleasant noise. The tame coon prowled about under the table looking for crumbs. He walked very flat and swaying and slow, as though he were stuffed with wet sand. It gave him a very captive look. His eyes were very bright. Father got his violin and played some quivery tunes to us. Mother sang a little. It was nice. Carol put fifteen wishes on the tree. Seven of them, of course, were old ones about the camel, but all the rest were new. He wished a salt mackerel for his coon and a gold anklet for his crow. He wouldn't tell what his other wishes were. They looked very pretty. Fifteen silver buds as big as cones scattered all through the green branches. Rosalie made seven violet-colored wishes. I made seven. Mine were green. Father made three. His were blue. Mother's were red. She made three, too. The tree looked more and more as though rainbows had rained on it. It was beautiful. We thank Mother very much for having a Christmas tree garden. We felt very thankful toward everybody. We got sleepier and sleepier. We went to bed. I woke in the night. It was very lonely. I crept downstairs to get my best story book. There was a light in the parlor. There were voices. I peeped in. It was my father and mother. They were looking at the Christmas tree. I got an awful shock. They were having what books call words with each other, only it was sentences. Impudent young cub, said my father. How dared he stuff a hundred-dollar bill into our Christmas tree? Oh, I'm sure he didn't mean to be impudent, said my mother. Her voice was very soft. He heard the children telling about Uncle Charlie's gold piece. He, he wanted to do something, I suppose. It was too much, of course. He oughtn't to have done it. But a hundred-dollar bill, said my father. Every time he said it, he seemed madder. And yet, said my mother, if what you say about his father's sugar plantations is correct, a hundred-dollar bill probably didn't look any larger to him than a, than a two-dollar bill looks to us this year. We'll simply return it to him very politely, as soon as we know his address. He was going west somewhere, wasn't he? We shall hear, I suppose. Hear nothing, said my father. I won't have it. Do you see how he stared at Rosalie? It was outrageous, absolutely outrageous. And Rosalie, I was ashamed of Rosalie, positively ashamed. But you see, it was really the first young man that Rosalie has ever had a chance to observe, said my mother. If you had ever been willing to let boys come to the house, maybe she wouldn't have considered this one such a, such a thrilling curiosity. Stuff and nonsense, said my father. She's only a child. There'll be no boys come to this house for years and years. She's seventeen, said my mother. You and I were married when I was seventeen. That's different, said my father. He tried to smile. He couldn't. Mother smiled quite a good deal. He jumped up and began to pace the room. He demanded things. Do you mean to say, he demanded, that you want your daughter to marry this strange young man? Not at all, said Mother. Father turned at the edge of the rug and looked back. His face was all frowned. And I don't like him anyway, he said. He's too dark. His father roomed with you at college, you say, asked my mother very softly. Do you remember him, specially? Do I remember him? cried my father. 
He looked astonished. Do I remember him? Why, he was the best friend I ever had in the world. Do I remember him? And he was very fair? asked my mother. Fair? cried my father. He was as dark as a Spaniard. And yet reasonably respectable? asked my mother. Respectable? cried my father. Why, he was the highest-minded man I ever knew in my life. And so dark, said my mother. She began to laugh. It was what we call her cut-finger laugh, her bandage laugh. It rolled all around father's angriness and made it feel better almost at once. Well, I can't help it, said father. He shook his head just the way Carol does sometimes, when he's planning to be pleasant as soon as it's convenient. Well, I can't help it. Exceptions, of course, are exceptions. But Cuba? A climate all mushy with warmth and sunshine? What possible stamina can a young man have who's grown up on sugarcane syrup and, and bananas? He seemed to have teeth, said my mother. He ate two helpings of turkey. He had a gold cigarette case, said my father. Gold! My mother began to laugh all over again. Maybe his Sunday school class gave it to him, she said. It seemed to be a joke. Once father's Sunday school class gave him a high silk hat. Father laughed a little. Mother looked very beautiful. She ruffled her hair a little on father's shoulder. She pinked her cheeks from the inside some way. She glanced up at the topmost branch of the Christmas tree. The gold bud showed quite plainly. I, I wonder what he wished, she said. We'll have to look sometime. I made a little creak in my bones. I didn't mean to. My father and mother both turned around. They started to explore. I ran like everything. I think it was very kind of God to make December have the very shortest days in the year. End of Section 1, Part 1《セクション2》of《Fairy Prince and Other Stories》by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。《Fairy Prince》Part 2 。Summer, of course, is nice. The long, sunny light, lying awake till most nine o'clock every night to hear the blackness come rustling. Such a lot of early mornings everywhere and birds singing. Sizzling hot noons with cool milk to drink. A pleasant nap before it's time to play again. But if December should feel long, what would children do? About Christmas, I mean. Even the best way you look at it, Christmas is always the furthest off day that I ever heard about. My mother was always very kind about making Christmas come just as soon as it could. There wasn't much daylight, not in December, not in the north, not where we lived. Except for the snow, each day was like a little jet black jewel box with a single gold coin in the center. The gold coin in the center was noon. It was very bright. It was really the only bright light in the day. We spent it for Christmas, every minute of it. We popped corn and strung it into lovely loops. We threaded cranberries. We stuffed three yule logs with crackly cones and colored fires. We made little candies. All round the edges of the bright noontime, of course, there was morning and night and lamplight. It wasn't convenient to burn a great many lamps. At night, father and mother sat in the lamplight and taught us our lessons or read stories to us. We children sat in the shadows and stared into the light. The light made us blink. The tame crow and the tame coon sat in the shadows with us. We played we were all jungle animals together waiting outside a man's camp to be Christianized. It was pleasant. Mother read to us about a woman who didn't like Christmas specially. She was going to petition Congress to have the Christ child born in leap year, so that Christmas couldn't come oftener than once in four years. It worried us a little. Father laughed. Mother had only one worry in the world. She had it every year. Oh, my darling, darling winter garden, worried my mother. Wouldn't it be awful if I ever had to die just as my best Christmas tree was coming into bloom? It frightened us a little, but not too much. Father had the same worry every spring about his spring garden. Every May time, when the tulip buds were so fat and tight you could fairly hear them splitting, 
father worried. Oh, wouldn't it be perfectly terrible if I should die before I find out whether those new Rembrandts are everything that the catalogue promised, or whether the bizzards are really finer than the by-blooms. Now, if it wasn't flocks time, worried my father, especially if the flocks turned out magenta, one could slip away with scarcely a pang, but in tulip time. We promised our mother she should never die at Christmas time. We promised our father he should never die at tulip time. We brought them rubbers and kneeling cushions. We carried their coats. We found their trowels. We kept them just as well as we could. But most of all, of course, we were busy wondering about our presents. It hurries Christmas a lot to have a Christmas tree growing in your parlor for a whole month, even if the parlor door is locked. Lots of children have a Christmas tree for a whole month, but it's a going tree. Its going is very sad. Just one little wee day of perfect splendor it has. And then it begins to die. Every day it dies more. It tarnishes. Its presents are all gathered. Its popcorn gets stale. The cranberries smell. It looks scragglier and scragglier. It gets brittle. Its needles begin to fall. Pretty soon it's nothing but a clutter. It must be dreadful to start as a Christmas tree and end by being nothing but a clutter. But Mother's Christmas tree is a coming tree. Every day for a month it's growing beautifuler and beautifuler. The parlor is cool. It lives in a nice box of earth. It has water every day like a dog. It never dies. It just disappears. When we come down to breakfast the day after Christmas, it simply isn't there. That's all. It's immortal always when you remember it. It's absolutely perfect. We liked very much to see the Christmas tree come. Every Sunday afternoon my mother unlocked the parlor door. We were not allowed to go in, but we could peep all we wanted to. It made your heart crinkle up like a handful of tinsel to watch the tinfoil buds change into presents. Two of Carol's silver buds had bloomed. One of them had bloomed into a white paper package that looked like a book. The other one had strange humps. Only one of Rosalie's violet buds had bloomed, but it was a very large box tied with a red ribbon. It looked like a best hat. One of Father's blue buds had bloomed. One of Mother's red buds. They bloomed very small. Small enough to be diamonds or collar buttons. Way back on the further side of the tree, I could see that one of my green buds had bloomed. It was a long little box. It was a narrow little box. I can most always tell when there's a doll in a box. Young Derry Willard's golden bud hadn't bloomed at all. Maybe it was a late bloomer. Some things are. The tame coon salt fish, I've noticed, never blooms at all until just the very last moment before we go into the parlor Christmas morning. Mother says there's a reason. We didn't bother much about reasons. The parlor was very cold. It smelt very cold and mysterious. We didn't see how we could wait. Carol helped us to wait. Not being able to talk, Carol has plenty of time to think. He can write, of course, but spelling is very hard. So he doesn't often waste his spelling on just facts. He waits till he gets enough facts to make a philosophy before he tries to spell it. He made a philosophy about Christmas coming so slow. He made it on the blackboard in the kitchen. He wrote it very tall. Christmas has got to come, he wrote. It's part of time. Everything that's part of time has got to come. Nothing can stop it. It runs like a river. It runs downhill. It can't help itself. I should worry. Young Derry Willard never wrote at all. He telegraphed his manners instead. Thank you for Thanksgiving Day, he telegraphed. It was very wonderful. He didn't say anything else. He never even mentioned his address. Um, said my father. It's because of the hundred-dollar bill, said my mother. He doesn't want to give us any chance to return it. Humph, said my father. Do we look poor? My mother glanced at the worn spot in the dining-room rug. She glanced at my father's coat. We certainly do, she laughed. But young Derry Willard didn't leave us a hundred-dollar bill to try and make us look any richer. All young Derry Willard was trying to do was to make us look more Christmassy. 
"'Well, we can't accept it,' said my father. "'Of course we can't accept it,' said my mother. "'It was a mistake, but at least it was a very kind mistake.' "'Kind?' said my father. "'Very kind,' said my mother. "'No matter how dark a young man may be, "'or how much cane syrup and bananas he has consumed, "'he can't be absolutely depraved "'as long as he goes about the world "'trying to make things look more Christmassy.' "'My father looked up rather sharply. "'My mother gave a funny little gasp. "'Oh, it's all right,' she said. "'We'll manage some way. "'But who ever heard of a chicken bone hung on a Christmas tree "'or a slice of roast beef?' "'Some children don't get anything,' said my father. "'He looked solemn. "'Money is very scarce,' he said. "'It always is,' said my mother. "'But that's no reason why presents ought to be scarce.' "'My father jumped up. "'My father laughed. "'Great heavens, woman,' he said. "'Can't anything dull your courage?' "'Not my Christmas courage,' said my mother. "'My father reached out suddenly and patted her hand.' "'Oh, all right,' he said. "'I suppose we'll manage somehow.' "'Of course we'll manage somehow,' said my mother. "'I ran back as fast as I could to Carol and Rosalie. "'We thought a good deal about young Derry Willard coming. "'We talked about it among ourselves. "'We never talked about it to my father or my mother. "'I don't know why. "'I went and got my best storybook "'and showed the fairy prince to Carol. "'Carol stared and stared.' There were palms and bananas in the picture. There was a lace-paper castle. There was a moat. There was a fiery charger. There were dragons. The fairy prince was all in white armor, with a white plume in his hat. It grasped your heart, it was so beautiful. I showed the picture to Rosalie. She was surprised. She turned as white as the plume in the fairy prince's hat. She put the book in her top bureau drawer with her ribbons. We wondered and wondered whether young Derry Willard would come. Carol thought he wouldn't. I thought he would. Rosalie wouldn't say. Carol thought it would be too cold. Carol insisted that he was a tropic, and that tropics couldn't stand the cold. That if a single breath of cold air struck a tropic, he blew up and froze. Rosalie didn't want young Derry Willard to blow up and freeze. Anybody could see that she didn't. I comforted her. I said he would come in a huge fur coat. Carol insisted that tropics didn't have huge fur coats. All right, then, I said. He will come in a huge feather coat. Blue bird feathers it will be made of, with soft brown breast. When he fluffs himself, he will look like the god of all the birds and of next spring. Hawks and all evil things will scuttle away. There certainly was something the matter with the Christmas tree that year. It grew, but it didn't grow very fast. My father said that perhaps the fertilizer hadn't been rich enough. My mother said that maybe all Christmas trees were blooming rather late this year. Seasons change so. My father and mother didn't go away to town at all, not for a single day. Late at night, after we'd gone to bed, we heard them hammering things and running the sewing machine. Carol thought it smelt like kites. Rosalie said it sounded to her like a blue silk waist. It looked like a worry to me. It got colder and colder. It snowed and snowed. Christmas Eve it snowed some more. It was beautiful. We were very much excited. We clapped our hands. We stood at the window to see how white the world was. I thought about the wise men's camels. I wondered if they could carry snow in their stomachs as well as rain. Mother said camels were tropics and didn't know anything about snow. It seemed queer. A sleigh drove up to the door. There were three men in it. Two of them got out. The first was young Derry Willard. It was a fur coat that he had on. He was full of bundles. My father gave one gasp. The impudent young gasped my father. We ran to the door. The second man looked just exactly like young Derry Willard, except that he had on a gray beard and a gray slouch hat. He looked like the picture of a planter in Uncle Tom's cabin. My father and he took just one look at each other, and then suddenly they began to pound each other on the back and to hug each other. "'Hello, old top!' they shouted. "'Hello, hello, hello!' Derry Willard's father cried a little. Everybody cried a little or shouted. 
or pounded somebody on the back, except young Derry Willard and Rosalie. Young Derry Willard and Rosalie just stood and looked at each other. "'Well, well, well,' said Derry Willard's father over and over and over. Twenty years! Twenty years!' The front hall was full of bundles. We fell on them when we stopped, and we fell on new ones when we tried to get up. Whenever Derry Willard's father wasn't crying, he was laughing. "'So this is the wife,' he said, "'and these are the children. Which is Rosalie? Ah, a very pretty girl, but not as pretty as your wife.' He laughed. Twenty years! Twenty years!' he began all over again. "'A bit informal, hey? Descending on you like this? But I couldn't resist the temptation after I'd seen Derry. We Southerners, you know. Our impulses are romantic. Tuck us away anywhere, or turn us out if you must. My father was like a wild man for joy. He forgot all about everything except twenty years ago. We had to put the two Mr. Derry Willards to bed in the parlor. There was no other room. They insisted on sleeping with the Christmas tree. They had camped under every kind of branch and twig in the world, they said, but never had they camped under a Christmas tree. Father talked and talked and talked. Derry Willard's father talked and talked and talked. It was about college. It was about girls. It was about boys. It was about all sorts of pranks. Not any of it was about studies. Mother sat and laughed at them. Rosalie and young Derry Willard sat and looked at each other. Carol and I played checkers. Everybody forgot us. I don't know who put me to bed. When we came downstairs the next morning and went into the parlor to see the Christmas tree, we screamed. Every single weeny-teeny branch of it had sprouted tinsel tassels. There were tinsel stars all over it. Red candles were blazing. Glass icicles glistened. There were candy canes. There were tin trumpets. Little white paper presents stuck out everywhere through the branches. Big white presents piled like a snowdrift all around the base of the tree. Young Derry Willard's father seemed to be still laughing. He rubbed his hands together. "'Excuse me, good people,' he laughed, "'for taking such liberties with your tree. "'But it's twenty years since I've had a chance "'to take a real whack at a Christmas tree. "'Palms, of course, are all right, "'and banana groves aren't half bad. "'But when it comes to real landscape effect, "'give me a Christmas tree in a New England parlor.' "'Palms!' we gasped. "'Banana trees!' Young Derry Willard distributed the presents. For my father there were boxes and boxes of cigars, and an order on some Dutch importing house for five hundred green tulips. Father almost swooned. For mother there was a little gold chain with a single pearl in it, and a box of oranges as big as a chicken coop. I got four dolls and a paint box. One of the dolls was jet black. She was funny. When you squeaked her stomach, she grinned her mouth and said, "'Oh, Lord, child!' Rosalie had a white crepe shawl, all fringes, and gay-colored birds of paradise. Rosalie had a fan made out of ivory and gold. Rosalie had a gold basket full of candied violets. Rosalie had a silver hand mirror carved all round the edge with grasses and lilies like the edges of a little pool. Carol had a big, big box that looked like a magic lantern, and on every branch where he had hung his seven wishes for a camel, there was a white card instead, with one word, Palestine, written on it. Everybody looked much perplexed. Young Derry Willard's father laughed. If the youngster wants camels, he said, he must have camels. I'm going to Palestine one of these days before so very long. I'll take him with me. There must be heaps of camels still in Palestine. Going to Palestine before long, gasped my mother. How wonderful! Everybody turned and looked at Carol. Want to go, son, Hey, laughed Derry Willard's father. Carol's mouth quivered. He looked at my mother. My mother's mouth quivered. A little red came into her cheeks. "'He wants me to thank you very much, Mr. Willard,' she said. "'But he thinks perhaps you wouldn't want to take him to Palestine "'if you knew that he can't talk.' "'Can't talk?' cried Mr. Derry Willard. "'Can't talk? 
He looked at Mother. He looked at Carol. He swallowed very hard. Then suddenly he began to laugh again. Good enough, he cried. He's the very boy I'm looking for. We'll rear him for a diplomat. Carol got a hammer and opened his big box. It was a magic lantern. He was wild with joy. He beat his fists on the top of the box. He stamped his feet. He came and burrowed his head in Mother's shoulder. When Carol burrows his head in my mother's shoulder, it means, call me anything you want to. Mother called him anything she wanted to, right out loud before everybody. Shining face, said my mother. There were lots of other presents besides. My father had made a giant kite for Carol. It looked nine feet tall. My father had made the dearest little wooden work box for my mother. There was a blue silk waist for Rosalie. My mother had knitted me a doll. Its body was knitted. Its cheeks were knitted. Its nose was knitted. It was wonderful. We ate the peppermint candy canes, all the pink stripes, all the white stripes. We sang carols. We sang, Oh, the foxes have holes, and the birds build their nests in the crotch of the sycamore tree. But the little son of God had no place for his head when he cameth to earth for me. Rosalie's voice was like a lark in the sky. Carol's face looked like two larks in the sky. The tame crow stayed in the kitchen. He was afraid of so many strangers. The tame coon wasn't afraid of anything. He crawled in and out of all the wrapping papers, sniffing and sniffing. It made a lovely crackling sound. Everything smelt like fir balsam. It was more beautiful every minute. Even after every last present was picked from the tree, the tree was still so fat and fluffy with tinsel and glass balls that it didn't look robbed at all. We just sat back and stared at it. Young Derry Willard stared only at the topmost branch. Father looked suddenly at Mother. Mother looked suddenly at Rosalie. Rosalie looked suddenly at Carol. Carol looked suddenly at me. I looked suddenly at the tame coon. The tame coon kept right on crackling through the wrapping papers. Young Derry Willard made a funny little face. There seemed to be dust in his throat. His voice was very dry. He laughed. My wish, said young Derry Willard, seems to have been the only one that didn't bloom. I almost died with shame. Carol almost died with shame. And all that splendiferousness and all that generosity... Poor Derry Willard's gold-budded wish was the only one that hadn't at least bloomed into something. Rosalie jumped up very suddenly and ran into the dining room. She looked as though she was going to cry. Young Derry Willard followed her. He didn't run. He walked very slowly. He looked a little troubled. Carol and I began at once to fold the wrapping papers very usefully. Young Derry Willard's father looked at my father. All of a sudden he wasn't laughing at all, or rubbing his hands. "'I'm sorry, Dick,' he said. "'I've always rather calculated somehow on having my boy's wishes come true.' My father spoke a little sharply. "'You must have a lot of confidence,' he said, "'in your boy's wishes.' "'I have,' said young Derry Willard's father, quite simply. "'He's a good boy. Not only clever, I mean, but good. Never yet have I known him to wish for anything.' that wasn't the best. They're too young, said my father. Youth, said Derry Willard's father, is the one defect I know of that is incontestably remedial. How can they possibly know their own minds, demanded my father. No person, said Derry Willard's father, knows his own mind until he's ready to die. But the sooner he knows his own heart, the sooner he's ready to begin to live. My father stirred in his chair. He lit a cigar. It went out. He lit it again. It went out again. He jerked his shoulders. He looked nervous. He talked about things that nobody was talking about at all. The young rascal dropped a hundred-dollar bill when he was here before, he said. He said it as though it was something very wicked. Young Derry Willard's father seemed perfectly cheerful. Did he really, he said? "'It's a wonder the crow didn't eat it,' snapped my father. "'But even the crow wouldn't eat it, eh?' said Derry Willard's father. Quite suddenly he began to laugh again. 
He looked at my mother. He stopped laughing. His voice was very gentle. Don't be proud, he said. Don't ever be proud. He threw out his hand as though he was asking something. What difference does anything make in the whole world, he said, except just young love and old friendship? Oh, pshaw, said my father. Oh, pshaw. Rosalie came and stood in the door. She looked only at mother. She had on a red coat and a red hat and red mittens. Derry Willard wants to see the Christmas tree garden, she said. May I go? Derry Willard stood just behind her. He had on his fur coat. He looked very hard at father. When he spoke, he spoke only to father. Is it all right, he said. May I go? My father looked up, and then he looked down. He looked at Derry Willard's father. He threw out his hands as though there was no place left to look. A little smile crept into one corner of his mouth. He tried to bite it. He couldn't. Oh, pshaw, he said. Carol and I went out to play. We thought we'd like to see the Christmas tree garden, too. The snow was almost as deep as our heads. All the evergreen trees were weighed down with snow. Their branches dragged on the ground. It was like walking through white plumes. We found Mother's Christmas tree garden. We found Rosalie and young Derry Willard standing right in the middle of it. It was all caves and castles. It was like a whole magic little city all made out of white plumes. The sun came out and shone on it. Blue sky opened overhead. Everything crackled. It was more beautiful even than the Christmas tree in the parlor. They didn't hear us. Rosalie gave a funny little cry. It was like a sob, only happy. I love Christmas, she said. I love you, said Derry Willard. He snatched her in his arms and kissed her. A great pine tree shivered all its snow down on them like a veil. We heard them laugh. We ran back to the house. We ran just as fast as we could. It almost burst our lungs. We ran into the parlor. I didn't tell. Carol couldn't tell. My father and young Derry Willard's father were talking and talking behind great clouds of smoke. The yule log was blazing and sputtering all sorts of fireworks and colors. Only mother was watching it. She was paring apples as she watched. A little smile was in her eyes. What a wonderful, wonderful day to have it happen, she said. I couldn't stand it any longer. I ran upstairs and got my best story book. I brought it down and opened it at the picture of the fairy prince. I laid it open like that in Mr. Willard's lap. I pointed at the picture. There, I said. Derry Willard's father put on his glasses and looked at the picture. Well, upon my soul, he said, where did you get that? It's my book, I said. It's always been my book. My father looked at the picture. Why, of all things, he said. Why, it looks exactly like Derry, said my mother. It is Derry, said Derry's father. But don't ever let Derry know that you know that it is. It seems to tease him a little. It seems to tease him a very great deal, in fact, being all rigged out like that. The illustrator is a friend of mine. He spent the winter in Cuba three or four years ago, and he painted the picture there. I looked at Carol. Carol looked at me. It was an absolutely perfect Christmas. If this were true, then everything beautiful that there was in the world was true, too. Carol nudged me to speak. Then Derry really is a fairy prince, I said. Father started to speak. Mother stopped him. Yes, Rosalie's fairy prince, she said. End of section two. Section three of Fairy Prince and Other Stories by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Game of Bewitchments, Part 1 We like our Aunt Esta very much, because she doesn't like us. That is, she doesn't like us specially. Toys are what our Aunt Esta likes specially. Our Aunt Esta invents toys. She invents them for a store in New York. Our Aunt Esta is thirty years old with very serious hair. 
I don't know how old our other relatives are, except Rosalie, and Carol, and myself. My sister Rosalie is seventeen years old, and a betrothess. Her betrother lives in Cuba. He eats bananas. My brother Carol is eleven. He has no voice in his throat, but he eats anything. I myself am only nine, but with very long legs. Our father and mother have no age. They are just tall. There was a man. He was very rich. He had a little girl with sick bones. She had to sit in a wheelchair all day long and be pushed around by a black woman. He asked our Aunt Esta to invent a game for her. The little girl's name was Posy. Our Aunt Esta invented a game. She called it the game of the bewitchments. It cost two hundred dollars and forty-three cents. The rich man didn't seem to mind the two hundred dollars, but he couldn't bear the forty-three cents. He'd bear even that, though, he said, if it would only be sure to work. Work, said our Aunt Esta. Why, of course it will work. So just the first minute she got it invented, she jammed it into her trunk and dashed up to our house to see if it would. It worked very well. Our Aunt Esta never wastes any time, not even kissing either coming or going. We went right up to her room with her. It was a big trunk. The express man swore a little. My father tore his trouser knee. My mother began right away to re-varnish the scratches on the bureau. It took us most all the morning to carry the game downstairs. We carried it to the dining room. It covered the table. It covered the chairs. It strewed the sideboard. It spilled over on the floor. There was a pair of white muslin angel wings all spangled over with silver and gold. There was a fairy wand. There was a shining crown. There was a blue satin clock. There was a yellow plush suit and swishy tail all painted sideways, in stripes like a tiger. There was a most furious tiger head with whisk broom whiskers. There was a green frog's head and a green frog suit. There was a witch's hat and cape and a hump on the back. There were bows and arrows. There were boxes and boxes of milliner's flowers. There were strings of beads and yards and yards of dungeon chains made out of silver paper and a real bugle and red Chinese lanterns and, and everything. The rich man came in a gold-colored car to see it work. When he saw the dining room, he sickened. He bit his cigar. My daughter Posy is ten years old, he said. What I ordered for her was a game, not a trousseau. Our Aunt Esta shivered her hands. She shrugged her shoulders. You don't understand, she said. This is no paltry toy to be exhausted and sickened of in a single hour. This is a real game. Ethical. Psycho. Psychological. Unendingly diverting. Hour after hour. Day after day. Once begun, you understand, it's never over. The rich man looked at his watch. I have to be in Chicago a week from tomorrow, he said. Somebody giggled. It couldn't have been Rosalie, of course, because Rosalie is seventeen. And of course it wasn't Carol. So it must have been me. The rich man gave an awful glare. Who are these children, he demanded. Our Aunt Esta swallowed. They are my, my demonstrators, she said. Demonstrators, sniffed the rich man. He glared at Carol. Why don't you speak, he demanded. My mother made a rustle to the doorway. He can't, she said. Our son Carol is dumb. The rich man looked very queer. Oh, I say, he fumbled and stuttered. Oh, I say. After all, there's no such great harm in a giggle. My little girl Posy cries all the time. All the time, I mean. Cries and cries and cries. It's a fright. She wouldn't, said our Aunt Esta, if she had a game like this to play with. Eh? said the rich man. She could wear the witch's hideous cape, said our Aunt Esta, and the queer pointed black hat and the scraggly gray wig and the great horn-rimmed spectacles and the hump on her back and... My daughter Posy has tight, titian red curls, said the rich man coldly, and the most beautiful brown eyes that mortal man has ever seen and a skin so fair that 
"'That's why I think it would rest her so,' said our Aunt Esta, "'to be ugly outside, instead of inside for a while.' "'Eh?' said the rich man. He glared at our Aunt Esta. Our Aunt Esta glared at him. Out in the kitchen suddenly the most beautiful smell happened. The smell was soup. Spiced tomato soup. It was as though the whole stove had bloomed. My father came to the door. "'What's it all about?' he said. He saw the rich man. The rich man saw him. "'Why, how do you do?' said my father. "'Why, how do you do?' said the rich man. They bowed. There was no room on the dining-room table to put the dishes. There was no room anywhere for anything. We had to eat in the kitchen. My mother made griddle cakes. The rich man stirred the batter. He seemed to think it was funny. Carol had to sit on a soap-box. Our Aunt Esta sat on the edge of a barrel with her stockings swinging. It made her look not so strict. All the same, worried the rich man. I don't see just why you fixed the price at two hundred dollars and forty-three cents. Why not two hundred dollars and forty-five cents, or even the round sum two hundred and one dollars? Our Aunt Esta looked pretty mad. I will be very glad, I'm sure, she said, to submit an itemized bill. Oh, nonsense, said the rich man. It was just your mental processes I was worrying about. The thing, of course, is worth any money if it works. If it works, cried our Aunt Esta. The rich man jumped up and strode fiercely to the dining-room door. Our Aunt Esta strode fiercely after him, only littler. Our Aunt Esta is very little. The rich man waved his arms at everything. The boxes, the bundles, the angel wings, the cloaks, the suits, the Chinese lanterns. All the same, the thing is perfectly outrageous. The size of it, the extent, no house would hold it. It isn't meant, said our Aunt Esta, to be played just in the house. It's meant to be played on a sunny porch opening out on a green lawn, so that there's plenty of room for all Posy's little playmates to go swarming in and out. The rich man looked queer. He gave a little shiver. My little daughter Posy hasn't got any playmates, he said. She's too cross. Our Aunt Esta stood up very straight. Two red spots flamed in her cheeks. You won't be able to keep the children away from her, she said, after they once begin to play this game. You really think so? cried the rich man. Out in the kitchen my father looked at my mother. My mother looked at my father. They both looked at us. My father made a little chuckle. It would seem, said my father, as though it was the honor of the whole family that was involved. He made a whisper in Carol's ear. Go to it, son, he whispered. Rosalie jumped to her feet. Carol jumped to his feet. I jumped to my feet. We snatched hands. We ran right into the dining room. Carol's face was shining. Who's going to be posy with the sick bones, I cried. Shh! said everybody, except our Aunt Esta. Our Aunt Esta suddenly seemed very much encouraged. She didn't wait a minute. She snatched a little book from her pocket. It was a little book that she had made herself, all full of typewriter directions about the game. Someone, of course, she said, will have to be the witch. Someone who knows the game, I mean. So perhaps I... We rushed to help her drag the old battered tricycle to the porch. We helped her open up every porch door till all the green lawn and gay petunia blossoms came right up and fringed with the old porch rug. We helped her tie on the witch's funny hat and the scraggly gray wig and the great horn-rimmed spectacles. We helped her climb into the tricycle seat. We were too excited to stay on the porch. We wheeled her right out on the green lawn itself. The green lilac hedge reared all up around her like a magic wall. We screamed with joy. The rich man jumped when we screamed. The rich man's name was Mr. Trent. And Mr. Trent shall be the black woman who pushes you all about, we screamed. I will not, said Mr. Trent. But Carol had already tied a black velvet ribbon on the rich man's leg to show that he was. Our Aunt Esta seemed more encouraged every minute. She stood us all up in front of her, even Father. She read from her book. It was a poem. The poem said, 
Now come ye all to the witch's ball, ye great, ye small, ye short, ye tall, come one, come all. I will not, said the rich man. He sweated. Oh, shucks, be a sport, said my father. I will not, said the rich man. He glared. Our Aunt Esther tried to read from her book and wave her wand at the same time. It waved the rich man in the nose. Foul menial, waved our Aunt Esther. Bring in the captives. Who, demanded the rich man? You, said our Aunt Esther. The rich man brought us in, especially father. He bound us all up in silver paper chains. He put a silver paper ring through my father's beautiful nose. Oh, I say, protested my father. It was guests that I understood we were to be, not captives. Ha! sniffed the rich man. Be a sport. They both glared. Our Aunt Esta had cakes in a box. They seemed to be very good cakes. Now, in about ten minutes, read our Aunt Esta from her book, you will all begin to feel very queer. Oh, Lordy, said my father. I knew it, said the rich man. I knew it all the time, from the very first mouthful. My stomach. Is there no antidote? cried my mother. Our Aunt Esta took off her horn-rimmed spectacles. She sniffed. Silly, she said. This is just a game, you know. Nevertheless, said the rich man, I certainly feel very queer. When you all feel equally queer, said our Aunt Esther coldly, we will proceed with the game. We all felt equally queer just as soon as we could. Our Aunt Esther made a speech. She made it from her little book. Poor helpless captives, said the speech. You are now entirely in my power. Yet fear not. If everybody does just exactly as I say, all may yet be well. Hear, hear, said my father. The rich man suddenly seemed to like my father very much. He reached over and nudged him in the ribs. Shut up, he whispered. The less you say, the sooner it will be over. My father said less at once. He seemed very glad to know about it. Our Aunt Esta pointed to a box full of little envelopes. Foul menial, she said, bring the little envelopes. The rich man brought them, but not very cheerfully. Oh, of course it's all right to call me that, he said, but I tell you quite frankly that my daughter Posy's maid will never stand for it. Her name is Elizabeth Lou, Mrs. Jane Frank Elizabeth Lou, even. Our Aunt Esther looked at the rich man. Her look was scornfuller and scornfuller. All witches' servants, she said, are called foul menial, from the earliest classical records of fairy tale and legend down to not in our times, insisted the rich man. I defy you in any intelligence office in New York to find a a our Aunt Esther brushed the contradiction aside. She frowned, not just at the rich man, but at everybody. We will proceed with the rehearsal as written, she said. She gruffed her voice. She thumped her wand on the floor. Each captive, she said, will now step forward and draw a little envelope from the box. Each captive stepped forward and drew a little envelope from the box. Inside each envelope was a little card. Very black ink words were written on each card. Captives stand up very straight, ordered our Aunt Esther. Every captive stood very straight. Knock your knees together with fear, ordered our Aunt Esther. Every captive knocked his knees together with fear. Strain at your chains, ordered our Aunt Esta, but not too hard, remembering they are paper. Every captive strained at his chains, but not too hard, remembering they were paper. Our Aunt Esta seemed very much pleased. She read another poem from her book. The poem said, Imprisoned thus in my witchy wiles, Robbed of all hope, all food, all smiles, a fearful doom o'erhangs thy rest, unless thou meet my dread behest. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, cried our mother. Can nothing save us? My father burst his nose ring. Rosalie giggled. Carol and I jumped up and down. We clapped our hands. The rich man cocked his head on one side. He looked at our Aunt Esta, at her funny black pointed hat, at her scraggly gray wig at her great horn-rimmed spectacles, at the hump on her back. Um, he said, what do you mean, witchy wiles? 
Silence, said our Aunt Esther. Read your cards. We read our cards. Carol's card said, Pink Breeze on it, and Slimy Frog. Our Aunt Esther poked Carol twice with her wand. Pitiful wretch, said our Aunt Esther. It is now two o'clock. Unless you are back here exactly at three o'clock, bearing a pink breeze in your hands, you shall be turned for all time and eternity into a slimy green frog. Go hence. Carol went hence. He henced as far as the mulberry tree on the front lawn. He sat down on the grass with the card in his hand. He read the card and read it and read it. It puzzled him very much. Pitiful wretch, go hence, cried our Aunt Esta. He henced as far as the larch tree this time and sat down all over again and puzzled and puzzled. Go hence, I say, pitiful wretch, insisted our Aunt Esta. My mother didn't like Carol to be called a pitiful wretch. It was because he was dumb, I suppose. When my mother doesn't like anything, it spots her cheekbones quite red. Her cheekbones were spotted very red. Stop your fussing, said our Aunt Esta, and attend to your own business. My mother attended to her own business. The business of her card said, Silver Bird and Horse's Hoof. Even our Aunt Esta looked a bit flabbergasted. Oh dear, oh dear, said our Aunt Esta. I certainly am sorry that it was you who happened to draw that one. And all dressed up in white, too, as you are. But after all, she jerked with a great toss of her scraggly wig. A game is a game, and there can be no concessions. No, of course not, said my mother. Lead me to the slaughter. There is not necessarily any slaughter connected with it, said our Aunt Esta, very haughtily. But she hit my mother only once with her wand. Frail creature, she said. On the topmost branch of the tallest tree in the world, there is a silver bird with a song in his throat that has never been sung. Unless you bring me this bird singing, you are hereby doomed to walk with the clatter of a horse's hoof. Horse's hoof, gasped my mother, with the clatter of a horse's hoof? My father was pretty mad. Why, it's impossible, he said. She's as light as thistledown. Even in her boots it's like a fairy passing. Nevertheless, insisted our Aunt Esta, she shall walk with the clatter of a horse's hoof, unless she brings me the silver bird. My mother started at once for the little woods. I can at least search the tallest tree in my world, she said. It made my father nervouser and nervouser. Now don't you dare, he called after her, climb anything until I come. Base interloper, said our Aunt Esta. Keep still. Who, said my father? You, said our Aunt Esta. I giggled. Our Aunt Esta was very mad. She turned me into a white rabbit. I was made of white canton flannel. I was very soft. I had long ears. They were lop ears. They were lined with pink velvet. They hung way down over my shoulders, so I could stroke them. I liked them very much, but my legs looked like white night drawers. Ruthie the Rabbit was my name. Our Aunt Esta scolded it at me. Because of your impudence, Ruthie the Rabbit, she said, you shall not be allowed to roam the woods and fields at will, but shall stay here in captivity close by my side, and help the foul menial do the chores. The rich man seemed very much pleased. He winked an eye. He pulled one of my lop ears. It was nice to have somebody pleased with me. Everybody was pleased with Rosalie's bewitchment. It sounded so restful. All Rosalie had to do was to be very pretty, just exactly as she was, and seventeen years old just exactly as she was and sit on the big gray rock by the side of the brook, just exactly as it was, and see whether it was a bright green celluloid fish or bright red celluloid fish that came down the brook first. And if it was a bright green celluloid fish, she was to catch it and slit open its stomach and take out all its directions and follow them. And if it was a bright red celluloid fish, she was to catch it and take out all its directions and follow them. In either case, her card said she would need rubbers and a trowel. 
It sounded like buried treasure to me, or else iris roots. Our Aunt Esta is very much interested in iris roots. It was my father's bewitchment that made the only real trouble. Nothing at all was postponed about my father's bewitchment. It happened all at once. It was because my father knew too much. It was about the alphabet that he knew too much. The words on my father's card said alphabet, and backwards, and pink silk fairy, and tin locomotive head, and three minutes. Our Aunt Esther turned my father into a pink silk fairy with white charlatan wings because he was able to say the alphabet backwards in three minutes. My father refused to turn. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He swore he wouldn't. He said it was a cruel and unnecessary punishment. Our Aunt Esther said it wasn't a punishment. It was a reward. It was the tin locomotive head that was the punishment. My father said he wouldn't have cared a rap if it had been the tin locomotive head. He could have smoked through that, but he wouldn't be a pink silk fairy with white charlatan wings. The rich man began right away to untie the black velvet ribbon on his leg and go home. He looked very cheated. He scorned my father with ribald glances. Work, he gloated. Of course it won't work. I knew all the time it wouldn't work. Two hundred dollars and forty-three cents, he gloated. Ha! Our Aunt Esther cried. She put her hand on my father's arm. It was a very small hand. It didn't look a bit like a witch's hand. Except for having no lovingness in it, it looked a good deal like my mother's hand. My father consented to be turned a little, but not much. He consented to wear the white tarlatan wings and the gold paper crown, but not the garland of roses. He would carry the pink silk dress on his arm, he said, but he would not wear it. The rich man seemed very much encouraged. He stopped untying the black velvet ribbon from his leg. He grinned a little. My father told him what he thought of him. The rich man acknowledged that very likely it was so, but he didn't seem to mind. He kept right on grinning. My father stalked away in his gold paper crown with the pink dress over his arm. He looked very proud and noble. He looked as though even if dogs were sniffing at his heels, he wouldn't turn. His white wings flapped as he walked. The spangles shone. It looked very holy. The rich man made a funny noise. It sounded like snorting. End of section 3「Section Four of Fairy Prince and Other Stories by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Game of the Bewitchments, Part Two. My father turned round quicker than scat. He glared right through the rich man at our Aunt Esta. He told our Aunt Esta just what he thought of her. The rich man said it wasn't so at all, that the game undoubtedly was perfectly practical if— if nothing, said my father, it's you yourself that are spoiling the whole effect by running around playing you're a black slave with nothing on but a velvet ribbon round one knee. The very least you could do, said my father, is to have your face blacked and wear a plaid skirt. Eh? Yes, said the rich man. Our Aunt Esther was perfectly delighted with the suggestion. The rich man took her delight coldly. He glared at my father. I don't think I need any outside help, he said in the management of my affairs. As the owner, indeed, of one of the largest stores in the world, I... That's all right, said my father, but you never yet have tried to manage the children's Aunt Esta. Nothing can stop her. Nothing could. She pinned an old plaid shawl around the rich man's waist. She blacked his face. He had to kneel at her feet while it was being blacked. He seemed to sweat easily but our Aunt Esta blacked very easily, too. He looked lovely. Even my father thought he looked lovely. When he was done, he wanted to look in a mirror. My father advised him not to, but he insisted. My father got up from making suggestions and came and stood behind him while he looked. They looked only once. Something seemed to hit them. They doubled right up. It was laughter that hit them. 
They slapped each other on the back. They laughed and laughed and laughed. They made such a noise that my mother came running. It seemed to make our Aunt Esta a little bit nervous to have my mother come running. She pointed her wand. She roared her voice. Where is the silver bird? she roared. My mother looked just as swoony as she could. She fell on her knees. She clasped her hands. Oh, cruel witch, she said. I saw the bird, but I couldn't reach him. He was in the poplar tree. However in the world did you put him there? Was that what you were bribing the butcher's boy about this morning? Was that? Hush, roared our Aunt Esta. Your doom has overtaken you. Go hence with the clatter of a horse's hoof until such time as your incompetent head may... Oh, it wasn't my head that was incompetent, said my mother. It was my legs. The poplar tree was so very tall, so very fluffy and undecided to climb. So... With the clatter of a horse's hoof, insisted our Aunt Esta, there can be no mercy. None, implored my mother. None, said our Aunt Esta. She gave my mother two funny little wooden cups. They were something like clappers. You could hold them in your hand so they scarcely showed at all and make a noise like a horse galloping across a bridge or trotting or anything. It made quite a loud noise. It was wonderful. My mother started right away for the village. She had on white shoes. Her feet were very small. She sounded like a great team horse stumbling up the plank of a ferry boat. I think I'll go get the mail, she said. Like that, screamed my father. My mother turned around. Her hair was all curly. There were laughs in her eyes. I have to, she said. I'm bewitched. I'll go with you, said my father. My mother turned around again. She looked at my father, at his golden crown, at his white spangled wings, at the pink silk skirt over his arm. Like that, said my mother. My father decided not to go. The rich man said he considered the decision very wise. They glared. Way over on the other side of the green lilac hedge, we heard my mother trotting down the driveway. Clack, 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 sounded the hoofbeats. My lord, she's pacing, groaned my father. Clever work, said the rich man. Was she ever in a band? In a jazz band, you know, with bantam rooster whistles and drums that bark like dogs? In a what? cried my father. He was awful mad. Our Aunt Esta tried to soothe him with something worse. She turned to me. Now, Ruthie the Rabbit, she said, let us see what you can do to redeem the ignominy of your impudent giggling. She handed me the bright green and the bright red celluloid fishes. She poked her wand at me. Hopping all the way, she said, every step of the way, you understand, bear these two fish to the head waters of the magic brook. The little pool under the apple tree will do, and start them ex expeditiously down the brook towards Rosalie. Yes, am I said. Our Aunt Esta turned to the rich man. Foul menial, she said, push my chariot a little further down the lawn, into the shade. The foul menial pushed it. My father pushed a little, too. I hopped along beside them, flopping my long ears. Our Aunt Esta looked exactly like a witch. The rich man's black face was leaking a little, but not much. It would have been easier if he hadn't tripped so often on his plaid shawl skirt. My father's white wings flapped as he pushed. He looked like an angel who wasn't quite hatched. It was handsome. When we got to the thickest shade, there was a man's black felt hat bobbing along the top of the Japonica hedge. It was rather a soft-boiled looking hat. It was bobbing just as fast as it could towards the house. When our Aunt Esta saw the hat, she screamed. She jumped from her chariot as though it had been flames. She tore the scraggly gray wig from her head. She tore the hump from her back. She kicked off her wooden shoes. Her feet were silk. She ran like the wind for the back door. My father ran for the woodshed. The rich man dove into the lilac bush. When the rich man was all through diving into the lilac bush, he seemed to think that he was the only one present who hadn't done anything. What are you so scared about, Ruthie? He said. What's the matter with everybody? Who's the bloke? 
"'It's the new minister,' I said. "'Has he got the cholera or anything?' said the rich man. "'No, not exactly,' I explained. "'He's just our Aunt Esta's suitor.' "'Your Aunt Esta's suitor?' cried the rich man. "'Suitor?' He clapped his hand over his mouth. He burst a safety pin that helped lash the plaid shawl around him. "'What do you mean, suitor?' he said. It seemed queer that he was so stupid. "'Why, a suitor,' I explained, "'is a person who doesn't suit, so he keeps right on coming most every day to see if he does. As soon as he suits, of course, he's your husband and doesn't come any more at all because he's already there. The new minister, I explained very patiently, is a suitor for our Aunt Esta's hand. We crawled through the lilac bush. We peeped out. Our Aunt Esta hadn't reached the back door at all. She sat all huddled up in a heap on the embankment, trying to keep the new minister from seeing that she was in her stocking feet. But the new minister didn't seem to see anything at all except her hands. Being a suitor for her hands was natural, I suppose, that he wasn't interested in anything except her hands. Her hands were on her hair. The scraggly gray wig had rumpled all the seriousness out of her hair. It looked quite jolly. The new minister stared and stared and stared, except for having no lovingness in them. Her hands looked very much like my mother's. Our Aunt Esta's got nice hands, I said. The rich man burst another safety pin. Yes, by Jove, he said, and nice feet, too. He seemed quite surprised. How long's this minister fellow been coming here, he said. Oh, I don't know, I said. He comes whenever our Aunt Esta comes. The rich man made a grunt. He looked at the minister's hat. Think of courting a woman, he said, in a hat like that. Oh, our Aunt Esta doesn't care anything at all about hats, I said. It's time she did, said the rich man. We'll go out if you say so, I suggested, and help them have a pleasant time. The rich man was awfully mad. He pointed at his plaid shawl. He pointed at his black face. What, he said, go out like this, and make a fool of myself before that ninny hat? Why, he'd love it, I said. The rich man choked. That's quite enough reason, he said. There was a noise in the woodshed. We could see the noise through the window. It was my father trying to untie his wings. He couldn't. The rich man seemed to feel better suddenly. He began to mop his face. It's a great game, all right, he said, if you don't weaken. He pulled my ears. But why in the world, Ruthie, he worried, did she have to go and tuck that forty-three cents onto the end of the bill? Why, that's her profit, I explained. Her profit, gasped the rich man. Her profit? Why, she has to have something, I explained. She was planning to have more, of course. She was planning to go to Atlantic City. But everything costs so big, even toys. It's... Her profit, gasped the rich man. Forty-three cents on a two-hundred-dollar deal? He began to laugh and laugh. And she calls herself a businesswoman, he said. Why, she ought to be in an asylum. All women, in fact, ought to be in asylums, or else in homes of their own. Quite furiously, he began to pull my ears all over again. Businesswoman, he said. And both her feet would go at once in the hollow of my hand. Businesswoman. Out in the roadway, suddenly, somebody sneezed. It made the rich man jump awfully. Ruthie, stay where you are, he ordered. I can't, I called back. I'm already hopped out. From my hop-out I could see the person who sneezed. Anybody would have known that it was Posy with the sick bones. She was sitting in an automobile peering through the hedge. There was a black woman with her. The rich man crackled in the bushes. He reached out and grabbed my foot. He pulled me back. His face looked pretty queer. Yes, she's been there all the time, he whispered, but not a soul knows it. I wanted her to see it work. I wanted to be sure that she liked it, but I was afraid to bring her in. She catches everything so, and I knew there were children here, and I was afraid there might be something contagious. He peered out through the lilac branches. It was quite a good deal to peer at. Down in the meadow, Rosalie was still running up and down the soft banks of the brook, 
trying to catch the celluloid fish. She had on a green dress. It was a slim dress like a willow wand. She had her shoes and stockings in one hand, and a great bunch of wild blue forget-me-nots in the other. Her hair was like a gold wave across her face. She looked pretty. The springtime looked pretty, too. Out in the woodshed my father was still wrestling with his wings. Up on the green mound by the house our Aunt Esther was still patting her hair while the new minister stared at her hands. The rich man turned very suddenly and stared at me. "'Contagious!' he gasped out suddenly. "'Why, upon my soul, Ruthie, it's just about the most contagious place that I ever was in—in in my life!' He gave a funny little laugh. He glanced back over his shoulder towards the road. He groaned. "'But I shall certainly be ruined, Ruthie,' he said, "'if my little daughter Posy or my little daughter Posy's black woman ever see me at close range in these clothes.' He took my chin in his hands. He looked very deep into my eyes. "'Ruthie,' he said, "'you seem to be a very intelligent child. If you can think of any way, any way, I say, by which I can slink off undetected into the house and be washed. Oh, shucks, that's easy, I said. We'll make Posy be the witch. When I hopped out this time, I stayed hopped. I hopped right up on the wall and stroked my ears. When Posy with the sick bone saw me, she began to laugh and clap her hands and kick the black woman with her toes. Oh, I want to be the witch, she cried. I want to be the witch for ever and ever, and change everybody into everything. I'm going to wear it home in the automobile and scare the cook to death. I'm going to change the cook into a cup of beef tea and throw her down the sink. I'm going to change my poodle dog into a new moon, she giggled. I'm going to change my doctor into a balloon and cut the string. The rich man seemed perfectly delighted. I could see his face in the bushes. He kept rubbing his hands and nodding to me to go ahead. I went ahead just as fast as I could. The black woman began to giggle a little. She giggled and opened the automobile door. She giggled and lifted Posy out. She giggled and carried Posy to the witch's chariot. She giggled and tied the witch's hat under Posy's chin. She giggled and tied the humped back cape around Posy's neck. Posy never stopped clapping her hands, except when the witch's wig itched her nose. It was when the witch's wig itched her nose that the rich man slunk away on all fours to be washed. He giggled as he slunk. It looked friendly. Carol came. He was pretty tired, but he had the pink breeze in his hands. It was flocks. It was very pink. It was in a big flower pot. He puffed out his cheeks as he carried it and blew it into breezes. It was pretty. It was very heavy. He knelt at the witch's feet to offer it to her. When he looked up and saw the strange child in the witch's chair, he dropped it. It broke and lay on the ground, all crushed and spoiled. His mouth quivered. All the shine went out of his face. It scared Posy to see all the shine go out of his face. Oh, boy, boy, put back your smile, she said. Carol just stood and shook his head. Posy began to scream. Why doesn't he speak, she screamed. He can't, I said. He hasn't any speech. Why doesn't he cry, screamed Posy. He can't, I said. He hasn't any cry. Posy stopped screaming. "'Can't he even swear?' she said. "'No, he can't,' I said. "'He hasn't any swear.' Posy looked pretty surprised. "'I can speak,' she said. "'I can cry. I can swear.' "'You sure can, little missy,' said the black woman. Posy looked at Carol. She looked a long time. A little tear rolled down her cheek. "'Never mind, boy,' she said. "'I will help you make a new pink breeze.' Oh, Lord, little missy, said the black woman. You never help no one do nothing in your life. I will if I want to, said Posy, and we'll make a larkspur-colored breeze, too, if we want to, she said. 
and I'll have it on my window sill, all bluey and frilly and fluttery when everything else in the room is horrid and hushed and smothery, and we'll make a green breeze. She gave a little cry. She looked at the waving meadow where all the long silver-tipped grasses ducked and dipped in the wind. She stretched out her arms. Her arms were no bigger than the handles of our croquet mallets. We'll dig up all the waving meadow, she cried, and pot it into window-sill breezes for the hot people in the cities. You can't, I said. It would take more than an hour, and you've got to be the witch. I will not be the witch, said Posy. She began to scream. It's my game, she screamed, and I'll do anything I like with it. She tore off her black-pointed hat. She kicked off her stubby wooden shoes. She screamed to the black woman to come and bear her away. While the black woman bore her away, Carol walked beside them. He seemed very much interested that anyone could make so much noise. When Posy saw how much interested Carol was in the noise, she stopped entirely screaming to the black woman and screamed to Carol instead. While Carol walked beside the noise, I saw the new minister come down the road and go away. His face looked red. Our Aunt Esther came running. She was very businesslike. She snatched up her wooden shoes and put them on. She crammed on the scraggly gray wig and the humped back cape. Foul menial, she called. Come at once and resume the game. The black woman stepped out of the bushes. She looked very much surprised, but not half as surprised as our Aunt Esther. Our Aunt Esther rubbed her eyes. She rubbed them again and again. She looked at the black woman's face. It was a real black face. She looked at the black woman's woolly hair. It was real woolly hair. Her jaw dropped. Ruthie the rabbit, hop here, she gasped. I hopped. She put her lips close to my ear. Ruthie the rabbit, she gasped. Do I see what I think I see? Yes, you do, I said. She put her head down in her hands. She began to laugh and laugh and laugh. It was a queer laugh, as though she couldn't stop. The tears ran out between her fingers. Well, I certainly am a witch, she laughed. Her shoulders shook like sobs. The rich man came running. He had his watch in his hand. He was all clean and shining. He saw the black woman standing by the witch's chair. He saw the witch in the chair. He thought the witch was Posy. He grabbed her right up in his arms and hugged her. Though I'm late for a dozen directors' meetings, he cried, it's worth it, my precious, to see you laugh. I'm not your precious, cried our Aunt Esther. She bit, she tore, she scratched. She shook her scraggly gray wig curls all over her face. It was like a mask, but all the time she kept right on laughing. She couldn't seem to stop. The rich man kissed her, and kissed her right through her scraggly gray wig curls he kissed her. He couldn't seem to stop. Now at last, my precious, he said, we've learned how to live. We'll play more, we'll laugh more. Our Aunt Esther tore off her wig she tore off her hump. She shook her fist at the rich man, but she couldn't stop laughing. The rich man gave one awful gasp. He turned red. He turned white. He looked at the woodshed window to see if my father had seen him. My father had seen him. The rich man said things under his breath. That is, most of them were under his breath. He stalked to his car. He ordered the black woman to pick up the real posy and stalked to his car. He looked madder than pirates. But when he had climbed into his car and had started his engine and was all ready to go, he stood up on the seat instead and peered over the hedge top at our Aunt Esther and grinned. Our Aunt Esther was standing just where he had left her. All the laughter was gone from her, but her eyes looked very astonished. Her cheeks were blazing red her hair was all gay and rumpled like a sky terrier's. It seemed somehow to be rather becoming to our Aunt Esther to be kissed by mistake. The rich man made a little noise in his throat. Our Aunt Esther looked up. She jumped. The rich man fixed his eyes right on her. 
His eyes were full of twinkles. Talk about bewitchments, he said. Talk about bewitchments. I'll be back on Tuesday. What for? Great jumping Jehoshaphats, he said. It's enough that I'll be back. My father stuck his head in the tip of one battered wing out the woodshed window. He started to say something and cocked his ear instead. It was towards the village that he cocked his ear. We all stopped and cocked our ears. It was a funny sound. Clack, 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 clack. It was my mother cantering home across the wooden bridge. It sounded glad. My father thought of a new way suddenly to escape from his wings and ran to meet her. End of section four. Section five of Fairy Prince and Other Stories by Eleanor Hallowell Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Blinded Lady, Part One. The Blinded Lady lived in a little white cottage by the mill dam. She had twenty-seven cats and a braided rug and a Chinese cabinet all full of peacock feather fans. Our father and mother took us to see them. It smelt furry. Carol wore his blue suit. Rosalie wore an almost grown-up dress. I wore my new midi blouse. We looked nice. The blinded lady looked nice, too. She sat in a very little chair in the middle of a very large room. Her skirts were silk and very fat. They fluffed all around her like a pen wiper. She had on a white lace cap. There were violets in the cap. Her eyes didn't look blinded. We sat on the edge of our chairs and stared at her, and stared. She didn't mind. All the cats came and purred their sides against our legs. It felt soft and sort of bubbly. The blind lady recited poetry to us. She recited Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard. She recited The Charge of the Light Brigade. She recited Bingen on the Rhine. When she got all through reciting poetry, she asked us if we knew any. We did. We knew Onward Christian Soldiers and Hey Diddle Diddle the Cat and the Fiddle, and Rosalie knew two verses about It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. We hoped the blinded lady would be pleased. She wasn't. The blinded lady said it wasn't nearly enough just to know the first two verses of anything, that you ought to know all the verses of everything. The blinded lady said that every baby, just as soon as it was born, ought to learn every poem that it possibly could, so that if it ever grew up and was blinded, it would have something to amuse itself with. We promised we would. We asked the blinded lady what made her blinded. She said it was because she made all her father's shirts when she was six years old. We promised we wouldn't. And now, said the blinded lady, I'd like to have the little dumb boy come forward and stand at my knee so I can touch his face. Carol didn't exactly like to be called the little dumb boy, but he came forward very politely and stood at the blinded lady's knee. The blinded lady ran her fingers all up and down his face. It tickled his nose. He looked puckered. It's a pleasant face, said the blinded lady. We like it, said my father. Oh, very much, said my mother. Has he always been dumb, said the blinded lady? Always, said my mother, but never deaf. Oh, tush, said the blinded lady, don't be stuffy. Afflictions were meant to talk about. But Carol, you see, said my mother, can't talk about his, so we don't. Oh, tush, said the blinded lady. She pushed Carol away. She thumped her cane on the braided rug. There's one here, isn't there, she said, that hasn't got anything to be sensitive about. Let the young lassie come forward, she said, so I can touch her face. It made Rosalie very pink to have her face explored. The blinded lady laughed as she explored it. Ha, she said, age about seventeen, gold hair, sky-blue eyes, complexion like peaches and cream. Not much cause here, laughed the blinded lady, for this young lassie, ever to worry when she looks in the glass. Oh, but she does, I cried. She worries herself most to death every time she looks. She's afraid her hair will turn gray before dairy comes. Shh, said everybody. The blinded lady cocked her head. She ruffled herself. It looked like feathers. 
Derry, said the blinded lady, who's Derry? A beau? My father gruffed his throat. Oh, Derry's just a young friend of ours, he said. He lives in Cuba, said my mother. Cuba's an island, I said. It floats in water. They eat bananas. They have fights. It's very hot. There's lots of moonlight. Derry's father says that when Rosalie's married, he'll build a— Hush, Ruthie, said my father. You've talked quite enough already. The blinded lady patted her skirts. They billowed all around her like black silk waves. It looked funny. Hmm, she said. Let the child who's talked too much already come forward now, so that I can feel her face. I went forward just as fast as I could. The blinded lady touched my forehead. She smoothed my nose, my cheeks, my chin. Hmm, she said. And Ruthie, you say, is what you call her? My father twinkled his eyes. We have to call her something, he said politely. And is this bump on the forehead a natural one, said the blinded lady, or an accidental one? Both, said my father. That is, it's preeminently natural for our daughter Ruthie to have an accidental bump on her forehead. And there are, I infer, said the blinded lady, one or two freckles on either side of the nose. Your estimate, said my father, is conservative. And the hair, said the blinded lady, it hasn't exactly the texture of gold. Penny-colored, we call it said my mother. And not exactly a new penny at that, is it? said the blinded lady. No, said my mother, but rather jolly all the same, like a penny that's just bought two sticks of candy instead of one. And the nose turns up a little, said the blinded lady. Well, maybe just a trifle, admitted my mother. The blinded lady stroked my face all over again. Hmm, she said. Well, at least it's something to be thankful for that everything is perfectly normal. She put her hands on my shoulders. She shook me a little. Never, never, Ruthie, she said, be so foolish as to complain because you're not pretty. No, ma'am, I promised. Put all the beauty you can inside your head, said the blinded lady. Yes, am I promised. And I've just thought of another one that I know. It's about, you must wake and call me early, call me early, mother dear, for I'm to be queen of the May, mother, I'm to be... Foolish, said the blinded lady. It wasn't sounds I was thinking of this time, but sights. She pushed me away. She sighed and sighed. It puffed her all out. Oh, she sighed. Oh, three pairs of young eyes and all the world waiting to be looked at. She rocked her chair. She rocked it very slowly. It was like a little pain. I never saw anything after I was seventeen, she said. And God himself knows that I hadn't seen anywheres near enough before that. Just the little grass road to the village now and then on a Saturday afternoon to buy the rice and the meat and the matches and the soap. Just the woodlot beyond the hillside where the arbutus always blossom so early. Just old neighbor Nora's new patchwork quilt. Just a young man's face that looked in once at the window to ask where the trout brook was. But even these pictures, said the blinded lady, they're fading. Fading. Sometimes I can't remember at all whether old Nora's quilt was patterned in diamond shapes or squares. Sometimes I'm not so powerful sure whether the young man's eyes were blue or brown. After all, it's more than fifty years ago. It's new pictures that I need now, she said. New pictures. She took a peppermint from a box. She didn't pass them. She rocked her chair and rocked and rocked. She smiled a little. It wasn't a real smile. It was just a smile to save her dress. It was just a little gutter to catch her tears. Oh, dear me, oh, dear me, oh, dear me, said my mother. Stop your babbling, said the blinded lady. She sniffed and sniffed. But I'll tell you what I'll do, she said. These children can come back here next Saturday afternoon and— Why, there's no reason in the world, said my mother, why they shouldn't come every day. The blinded lady stopped rocking. She almost screamed. Every day, she said, mercy no. Their feet are muddy, and besides, it's tiresome. But they can come next Saturday, I tell you, and I'll give you a prize. Yes, I'll give two prizes for the two best new pictures that they bring me to think about. And the first prize shall be a peacock feather fan, said the blinded lady. And the second prize shall be a choice of cats. A choice of cats, gasped my father. The blinded lady thumped her cane. She thumped it pretty hard. 
It made you glad your toes weren't under it. Now mind you, children, she said. It's got to be a new picture. It's got to be something you've seen yourself. The most beautifulest, the most darlingest thing that you've ever seen. Go out in the field, I say. Go out in the woods. Go up on the mountain top and look around. Nobody, I tell you, can ever make another person see anything that he hasn't seen himself. Now be gone, said the blinded lady. I'm all chuckered out. Why, I'm sure, said my father, we never would have come at all if we hadn't supposed that. The blinded lady shook her cane right at my father. Don't be stuffy, she said, but get out. We got out. Old Mary, who washed and ironed and cooked for the blinded lady, showed us the shortest way out. The shortest way out was through the woodshed. There were twenty-seven little white bowls of milk on the woodshed floor. There was a cat at each bowl. It sounded lappy. Some of the cats were black. Some of the cats were gray. Some of the cats were white. There was an old tortoiseshell cat. He had a crumpled ear. He had a great scar across his nose. He had a broken leg that had mended crooked. Most of the cats were tortoiseshell and black and gray and white. It looked pretty. It looked something the way a rainbow would look if it was fur, and splashed with milk instead of water. "'How many quarts does it take?' said my mother. "'Quarts,' said old Mary. She sniffed. "'Quarts? It takes a whole Jersey cow.' The blinded lady called Rosalie to come back. I went with her. I held her hand very hard for fear we would be frightened. There was a white kitten in the blinded lady's lap. It was a white angora. It wasn't any bigger than a baby rabbit. It had a blue ribbon on its neck. It looked very pure. Its face said, Ruthie, I'd like very much to be your kitten. But the blinded lady's face didn't know I was there at all. Young lassie, said the blinded lady, what is the color of your dairy's eyes? Why, why, black, said Rosalie. Hmm, said the blinded lady. She began to munch a peppermint. Hmm, she said. She jerked her head. Her nose looked pretty sharp. That's right, young lassie, she cried. Love early. Never mind what the old folks say. Sometimes there isn't any late. Love all you can. Love. She stopped suddenly. She sank back in her skirts again and rocked. Her nose didn't look sharp any more. Her voice was all whispers. Lassie, she whispered, when you choose your peacock feather fan, choose the one on the top shelf. It's the best one. It's sandalwood. It's... My boots made a creak. The blinded lady gave an awful jump. There's someone else in this room besides the young lassie, she cried. I was frightened. I told a lie. You're entirely mistaken, I said. I perked Rosalie's hand. We ran for our lives. We ran as fast as we could. It was pretty fast. When we got out to the road, our father and mother were waiting for us. They looked pleasant. We liked their looks very much. Carol was waiting, too. He had his eyes shut. His mouth looked very surprised. Carol's trying to figure out how it would feel to be blind, said my mother. Oh, said Rosalie. Oh, said I. Carol clapped his hands. Rosalie clapped her hands. I clapped my hands. It was wonderful. We all thought of it at the same moment. We shut our eyes perfectly tight and played we were blinded all the way home. Our father and mother had to lead us. It was pretty bumpy. I peeped some. Rosalie walked with her hands stretched way out in front of her as though she was reaching for something. She looked like a picture. It was like a picture of something very gentle and wishful that she looked like. It made me feel queer. Carol walked with his nose all puckered up as though he was afraid something smelly was going to hit him. It didn't make me feel queer at all. It made me laugh. It didn't make my father laugh. Now see here, you young lunatic, said my father. If you think your mother and I are going to drag you up the main village street, acting like this... We were sorry, we explained, but it had to be. When we got to the village street, we bumped right into the old doctor. We bumped him pretty hard. He had to sit down. I climbed into his lap. Of course, I don't know that it's you, I said, but I think it is. The old doctor seemed pretty astonished. He snatched at my father and my mother. Great zounds, good people, he cried. 
what fearful calamity has overtaken your offspring absolutely nothing at all said my father compared to what is going to overtake them as soon as i get them home we're playing blinded said rosalie we've been to see the blinded lady i explained we're going to get prizes said rosalie real prizes a peacock feather fan and the choice of cats i explained foretelling the blinded lady next saturday cried rosalie the prettiest thing that we've ever seen not just the prettiest i explained but the most preciousest so we thought we'd shut our eyes said rosalie all the way home and find out what sight it was that we missed the most sunshine i think it is said rosalie sunshine and all the pretty flickering little shadows and the way the slender white church spire flares through the poplar trees oh i shall make up a picture about sunshine said rosalie oh sh said my mother you mustn't tell each other what you decide that would take half the fun and the surprise out of the competition would it said rosalie would it she turned to the old doctor she slipped into the curve of his arm the curve of his arm seemed to be all ready for her she reached up and patted his face you old darling she said in all the world what is the most beautifulest sight that you have ever seen the old doctor gave an awful swallow youth he said oh youth fiddlestick said my father however would one make a picture of that all arms and legs and wild ideas believe me that if i ever once get these wild ideas and legs and arms home to-day there will be we never heard what there would be cause we bumped into the storekeeping man instead and had to tell him all about it nobody kissed the storekeeping man he smelt of mice and crackers we talked to him just as we would have talked to sugar or potatoes mr storekeeping man we said you are very wise you have a store and a wagon and a big iron safe and fly papers besides in all the world what is the most beautifulest thing that you have ever seen the storekeeping man didn't have to worry about it at all he never even swallowed the instant he crossed his hands on his white linen stomach he knew my bank book he said my father laughed now you naughty children said my father i trust you'll be satisfied to proceed home with your eyes open but my mother said no matter how naughty we were we couldn't go home without buying popcorn at the popcorn stand so we had to tell the popcorn man all about it too the popcorn man was very little he looked like a pirate he had black eyes he had gold rings through his ears we loved him a good deal in all the world we asked the popcorn man what is the most beautifulest sight that you have ever seen it took the popcorn man an awful long time to think it took him so long that while he was thinking he filled our paper bags till they busted it was a nice bustedness end of section five